Righty, welcome, welcome, everyone. I hope that you have your cup of coffee. I actually just got mine, um, and unfortunately, it is kind of a lame cup of coffee. So don't judge me. But David, do you have some coffee for this chat or, or tea? Tea's okay too. Yeah. <laughs> Any coffee? I, I, I already <laughs> finished mine, but uh, um, nice. but it was it was right here. <laughs> Ooh, was that one of your own mugs too? That was one of my own mugs. <gasps> Oh yeah, for correct. anyone watching, David is also not only a, a brilliant engineer, but also a brilliant ceramicist. So <laughs> super cool. Yeah, timescale, the timescale team is quite talented. Um, I mean, maybe in code too. Yes, that's yeah. But like I feel like everyone has crazy mad skills like outside of work as well. And it's really awesome. Um all right, let's just jump into things. My name is Miranda All. Um, I am a developer advocate here at Timescale. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited for this stream. At least I'm super excited for the stream because we have our awesome guest joining us today, David Cohn, who is one of our database engineers. And we're going to be talking about some really cool stuff. So David, take introduce yourself. <laughs> Uh, I'm David Cohn. Uh, I am a software developer here. I have worked on kind of all the teams. Um, right now I'm on the toolkit team. Um, and yeah, so we're going to be talking a bit about some of the some of the stuff we've been working on on the toolkit team uh, around function pipelining and, and, and that sort of stuff uh, today. But um, yeah, that's the that's the very, very basic background. Um, and yeah, I also do pottery, as you may see some of it in the background there, next to some of the books. So, yeah, I'm like super pumped for this stream because function pipelines, as David mentioned, is going to be like the topic for today. And man, it it exploded yesterday, which is really exciting. And I feel like we're super pumped to see so many of you all getting so excited about this. Do you want to? tell us some more about, you know, what is function pipelines or what are function pipelines? Uh, sure. Uh, I guess I can, I can share my screen now. Um, so uh, a brief overview on, on function pipelines. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what, what we're sort of getting into here um, around both the problems with with SQL that we're that we're trying to solve, and this is not to say that SQL is bad by any means, um, and then going through how we did that, uh, including some things around the custom types, operators, and functions that we used to make function pipelines. Um, so let's start off uh, with some of the difficulties of pure SQL, um, and we'll think about an example of say a restaurant, um, and the restaurant basically is uh, you know it's it's getting to be colder. Um, as it is uh, getting colder, you've probably all had the experience of sitting by the door and the door opens and you get a chill breeze. Um, so let's say we have a thermometer near the door, we have a thermometer in the back. The back one obviously is gonna stay relatively constant while the one at the front of the restaurant is gonna be bouncing up and down as the door opens and closes. Um, so we wanna see uh, if we're trying to sort of develop an IoT product for the restaurant to see how well their, I don't know, that little uh, plasticky box thing over the door uh, is working at, at moder moderating the temperature. Uh, we need a measure of that volatility, the way that that temperature goes up and down. Um, so the way that we can measure that, um, I mean, so sometimes when you're looking at like financial market volatility, you'll use something like standard deviation to measure that. Here, that's not really going to work because the, the heat heating system sort of goes off at night. So the, the standard deviation is actually sort of dominated by that cyclical pattern of the temperature. So we can't really use standard deviation here because you have all those data points overnight. They're going to be lower. You're going to have basically these two modes. Um, but during the during service, um, you're still bouncing up and down. Um, and so what we're going to use instead is we can think about just trying to quantify how much this is changing. Right for that that thermometer at the back, it's really you know hardly mo uh, modulating at all, 
um, up at the front there or uh, during operating hours. And you just sort of have this nice large change, whereas the one in the middle, you're, it's bouncing around. And so if we can just quantify how much of that change is happening, um, that's going to give us a measure of volatility. So um, what we're going to do there uh, in order to get that is basically take the delta between each point. That's going to be a measure of the, the change. And we're not going to take the, if we were to just add up all of the deltas, we'd get a net value that would add, you know, actually end up being nothing because we start and end at the same temperature. So all the deltas end up basically adding up to zero. So we don't want a net change. We want the absolute value of each delta, um, which is going to be then a total amount of change that is happening. Um, so we take the sum of all of that, that's going to give us the total amount of change that is happening. Um, so that's our measure of volatility. So how do we do that in, in, in your SQL? Uh, imagine we have a table called measurements, right? So let's, let's think about how we're going to model this. We have a device ID, we have timestamps and values um, for each device ID. And the device ID obviously is going to represent uh, the front and back uh, uh, thermometers. So you know, device ID one might be the front and device ID two might be the back, who knows? Um, so how do we then calculate the volatility? Um, so this is what that, that query looks like. We have a window function to do the, the lag. So that's how we're going to do the delta. That's this val minus lag val over here. Um, and uh, we have our where clause. Uh, the group by actually is applying to this outer query here. I'm going to remove one indent. Um, so that's a little more clear, but the group by is, is doing is, is on the sum. So it's just a little bit hard to see exactly what's going on here. Um, and you know, that's not the craziest, but it, it just shows a few of the, the problems sometimes of working with your SQL. Um, and so we wanted to introduce a way of doing some of this that is a little bit easier. Um, whoops. Uh, so that's where function pipelines come in. Um, and we just think they're a bit more clear as to what's going on at each step of this process. So this is a function pipeline that represents the same calculation that we were doing in the SQL above. Um, and what we basically do is we make a time vector from the timestamp and value columns. We sort that time vector according to time. We take the delta between each point. We take the, the absolute value of that delta, and then we sum up all of that. So that's just a more succinct, simpler way of representing the same calculation. Um, and uh, so the way that we're able to do that is by using these custom types, custom operators, and custom functions um, in order to make these pipelines work. So the custom types that we have, the main one is going to be a time vector. And a time vector is basically just a collection of time value pairs. Um, so the way that I think about it is that a time vector is a finite subset of a time series, where a time series sort of goes on into the past and future. A time vector is just some region of that. Um, so the uh, essentially one device ID would be a time series. All of the data associated with that and all of the data that's going to come in about the thermometer at the front would be a time series about that thermometer. Um, and a time vector is just some region of time uh, in the measurements from that thermometer, let's say. Okay, so that's uh, that's basically what a time vector is. That was the first part of our function pipeline, right? We made a time vector. So yeah, I must say, this is so much more readable than the other SQL code, which is awesome. Yeah. You know, it's it's almost like a sentence, like you can read exactly what's happening, which is super cool. Yeah, and and so I mean, I think that that's uh, you know one of the things that we. Uh, we really wanted to do here was make that more readable. I mean, um, and, and this is where the, the operator comes in. It's an arrow operator. 
This, by the way, you don't actually have to use a real arrow. However, Google Slides automatically just takes anything that you make into, um, like whenever you type, uh, like I'm, tr I'm literally trying to type this <laughs> dash and then the thing and it automatically makes an arrow no matter what I do. So uh, you, it's Google. actually a dash with a, uh, is that a greater than or less than, greater than I think, um, a dash and a greater than sign. Um, uh, so just so you know, it's not actually an arrow but Google Slides does that. And I couldn't figure out how to do that. Uh, anyway, so. Um, uh, if someone from Google is watching, you should really, you should work on that. You should let people decide how to write things. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, I was thinking about like, maybe maybe I can put a, a space between them, but like now you, you think that there's a space there, there isn't actually a space there. So whatever, whichever, whichever is more clear to you, I can't express the real thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the arrow operator that is in our, our pipeline here is, is basically just saying, like, apply the next operation, apply the operation on the right to the inputs on the left, or really more simply do the next thing. So as we look, look at our function pipeline here, right, the arrow in each of these is, and I guess it does in code blocks, that's nice. Um, uh, the arrow there is, um, uh, basically saying, okay, I'm going to take this time vector, I'm going to sort it, and then I'm going to take the output of that, and I'm going to do the delta on that, right? So it just basically is do the next thing all the way down. And a lot of the inspirations for this were from like functional programming languages, which uh, have an idea of composition or pipelining this sort of operation, somewhat from data flow programming, which has similar sorts of ideas, um, things like pandas data frames, um, which have piped operations, things like that. Um, so those are some of the, the, some of the places that we drew inspiration from as we were building this. I think the actual sort of inspiration for this was the F sharp composition operator. Um, uh, but you know, that was more Josh than me. So I, 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 uh, <laughs> I know some about functional programming. I'm more of a SQL expert. Um, but, uh, Josh, Josh likes some of this stuff a lot more than I do. Um, and for everyone so, else, Josh is another engineer on the yes. toolkit team. Yeah, he's awesome. Um, we'll have him on sometime. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so as we were going through, this is sort of what this, uh, how we express this operation is with this operator. Um, Postgres allows you to find allows you to define custom operators. And it's allowed you to define custom operators, custom functions, com custom types from its earliest days. This is one of the things that was built into Postgres as part of how it worked as a database. Um, so it was an extension to the relational model um, to allow for people, like to allow people to model their data in a different way and allow for different types of operations. Originally it was like, they were like, well, how do we do geographic? queries in a database. Um, and instead of just building support in for geographic queries, what they did is they were like, okay, well, why don't we make this essentially pluggable because we're going to need to add more types and other people will want to add their own types. And so we're just taking advantage of some of the stuff around that. Um, so this, that that's stuff that's data. like baked into Postgres. Like, yeah. wow, that's super cool. Yeah. So all of that has been there since, um, honestly, I think like basically for the entirety of the last 25 years or 30, 35 years now that, that the Postgres project has been around, like that has been part of the syntax. Some of the other stuff that we use like in the main timescale DB extension, like all the, the hooks that go into the planner and things like that, those are later additions. Um, but the create operator, create type, create function have been part of the language from its earliest days. Wow, oh, that's awesome. Um, so, uh, yeah, so then what you're noticing is each of these things in our pipeline here. So this is this is why we call them function pipelines, right? Is that we have sort of various functions that we're applying um, in this pipeline sort of syntax. Um, and uh, each of these things we call a pipeline element. So sort, delta, abs, all of those would be pipeline elements. Um, and uh, so some of the things that you can do, I mean, we talked about Delta already. We have things like fill to, um, which is a slightly different version. If you've used time bucket gap fill, it works a little bit differently than time bucket gap fill. 
um, instead of you know always bucketing and then you apply something to that it actually is just saying well if i have more than a gap of interval um then i'm going to put a point in there so uh in, unlike time bucket gap fill where it's like i need one evenly spaced every 10 minutes and i'm going to aggregate in order to make a time bucket i can keep all of my data but then if i have a gap larger than x i'll fill in some data there um so that's a cool thing um LTPB is a downsampling algorithm that uh uses the largest triangle three buckets algorithm to downsample data um and you can do that either as so this was actually another reason that we made this time vector and it started us down this this function pipeline pathway in in, in, in the beginning is that we wanted to do something like LTCB. now if you know much about uh how aggregates work in Postgres. What um, one of the things that happens with something like downsampling is you'll have an aggregate and what you want to return from that aggregate is a set of data. And there are set returning functions in Postgres, but you don't, you can't have a set returning aggregate. So we had to return some data type that stored all of the stuff that we downsampled to. Um, and so that was the original use case for this time vector uh, was was actually in this LTCB, we would output an LTCB uh, a, a time vector as uh, part of an aggregate that did largest triangle three buckets. Um, and that's something we can go into some more later. Um, but anyway, so there's a lot more pipeline elements. Um, we have all sorts of, uh, you know, sort of unary mathematical operators. We have uh, binary mathematical operators. Um, some Lambda stuff, which is something maybe we can get into a little bit later. It's a little crazy and fun. Definitely um, want to hear about that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then various ways of aggregating. Um, the other thing that that is uh, that you might want to know here is that the um, this is this doesn't just apply to uh, time vector pipelines. So what we've been talking about here are mostly time vector pipelines. So all of this stuff is a time vector pipeline. However, um, if you have been looking at some of the toolkit stuff, we also have what we call two-step aggregation. I wrote a blog post that explains a lot of that. Um, it's a great so, blog post, by the way. If you have not read that blog post, highly recommend. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so there, it might be something like, uh, you know, I might write a query that's like stats ag, val right and the stats side produces an internal data type and if i want to get say the average out of it i would normally write something like average of stats ag of val or i could do that in the subquery and then do it elsewhere or if i want to get the standard deviation i could get the standard deviation right um this instead says instead of putting it wrapping it like this we're going to allow you to use this same operator to essentially do that. So if I want the standard deviation, I'll do it like that instead. So that's going to give me. Oh, neat. Um, so we're basically overloading this this uh, arrow operator um, to work both on these function pipelines and on uh, our aggregates so that uh, we can do both of these, these types of operations on it. Um, all of this, by the way, I should mention is experimental. If you want this to work, you're going to have to set your search path to time scale BB, or to toolkit experimental and like have that in there. Um, this is still very much in its early days. So like, keep that in mind. Um, I think actually we had a user try this out yesterday, find a bug. Um, we fixed the bug. <laughs> Uh, but it's not been like the bug base hasn't been released yet. So this is that's what's going to happen. These are experimental features. There's going to be more of that, I'm sure. That's just how that uh, how that works. We we try to develop in the open and get things out quickly so that we can start getting user feedback um, faster. So like you guys have the opportunity to really guide our development here um, by basically telling us what's working, what's not. You know, what's intuitive, what's not. How we can make these work better for y'all. Um, so I think that's about it in terms of uh, my presentation here. Um, I guess we can go back to 
so I am, I am curious. You showed a lot of functions, which is awesome. How many exactly do we have? <laughs> Out of um, curiosity, do you know off the top of your head? I don't know. Yeah, so I think there's, I, I was counting this for the blog post. I think there's 63 pipeline elements right now, including wow. all of the aggregate ones and the um, uh, and the time factor pipelines. Um, Jeez. So, uh, yeah, and there will be more. I mean, um, we've been building this over a few releases uh there's been like some of the some of the basis for it has been there for a little while um but a lot of the work was done in this last uh sort of six week period um which is generally our, our release cadence over in toolkit um i'm just trying to picture last six weeks i was expecting like a few months <laughs> six weeks yeah, no six weeks and, oh, and it's wow. mostly, okay. mostly josh and brian um I've been doing more a fair amount of writing these days, and so I've not been doing quite as much coding. So, um, yeah, uh, if you're a Rust Impressive. programmer, uh, we are we are hiring. Uh, also, uh, <laughs> so, uh, yes, please, please do come please to us. us. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so so that's the the basic gist of the. Um, the function pipeline syntax, um, and and I mean, and then I mean, in the toolkit extension, we already have, I think, over like four hundred and something functions and like a hundred types. Um, so I mean, I've been shouting out a lot. Uh, we work with PGX, which is a Rust framework for building Postgres extensions, um, and it really, really, really helps manage uh, manage all of those. Um, uh, all of those custom functions, custom types, operators, all the things that we're working with there. Um, because as it turns out, like all of this is a little bit more complicated than you know I'm making it seem here, right? Like that one arrow operator is actually technically behind the scenes, like five different operators uh, that happen to be overloaded with different types that it takes in on either side. Um, the function pipe, the the pipeline elements that we're talking about here don't actually, they're not actually exactly they're they're functions, but they do something a little bit different than a normal function does. So what they actually do is they return a custom type, and that custom type can get composed into a into a pipeline. At least when it's inside of a time vector pipeline, can get composed together, um, and then that whole thing gets applied by the operator. Um, so there's a little bit of magic happening behind the scenes. I must um, ask then. So. Yeah. You said that the the type you know ha, has to do with this this custom time vector. So then, how does how does it work? Because you mentioned that we can also use um, our aggregate functions as well with the pipeline. Does it like work the same way or? No. Uh, well, it, it's actually so th that's where you get into the separate operators. So the operator can take in a time vector on one side and pipeline element on the other side, but it can also take in. Um, so each of our aggregates has its own custom type. So one of the some of the pipeline elements or some of just normal aggregates will return that aggregate type. Once you have that aggregate type, the operator then says, "Oh, I see an aggregate type on my left side, um, and I see a different type of um, essentially function pipeline element uh, that it sees on the right side. I can apply this function pipeline element to this aggregate type in a different way than I would." to a time vector pipeline type. Um, so that's where some of like a lot of the different like uh, custom types, it turns out there's a lot more custom types than I'm talking about here um, <laughs> behind the scenes. Um, and so, and that's a lot of, a lot of that is to manage basically the overloading of the operator. So uh, when I talk about overloading, what I mean is that the same operator can be applied to different data types depending on uh, the data types that it sees. It's the same thing with function overloading in Postgres or in many other languages where you have a function signature that's defined on certain data types. And if it's defined in another set of data types, well, then it returns a different data type. Um, and that's the same thing here. So you basically can have the operator be defined. It, the operator essentially is just a function. It's a wrap, it's a, a wrapper around a function where its arguments are the left and right hand sides. Um, and so we have different data types that go into that operator 
And depending on the data types that you see in that operator, it produces a different data type on the other end. Um, so that's how the aggregates can work and the function pipeline stuff can work or the, the time vector pipeline stuff can work. Um, they're sort of using different types uh, on the way in and out. Uh, well, mostly on the way in. So if that helps, I'm not sure it does. <laughs> no, that's super neat. Wow. Gosh, you guys put a lot of work into this and it shows it's really, really cool. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for describing that and talking to us uh, or really teaching us more about these uh, this function pipeline functionality, I guess. <laughs> um, so I would the next thing is that we would love to actually like go through some examples because, um, you know, at least for me, I personally uh, love a good example and I love talking about things, but I feel like it just clicks a little bit more when I can actually see it in action and play around with it myself. Um, so I am, uh, I, I created a database with um, a data set called Avocado, which I thought was fitting considering that I am a developer advocate. David is like an honorary developer advocate. And if you're not familiar with the, the lingo, developer advocates are sometimes called developer avocados or avocado, you know, advocate avocado, you know, it's close. <laughs> so we thought this was a perfect data set to use, you know, for an example. Um, so this is actually a data set that I grabbed from Kaggle and it's, um, just like generic, uh, like avocado information. So this is my um, database that I have. I'm using dBeaver, by the way, which is a really cool UI for interacting with your time scale. Or like, I think they have tons of different database types that you could import into dBeaver. It's a free tool. I, I really like using it, um, especially if I'm like playing around with data and I need to see things like, I, I prefer this over the terminal when I'm doing like exploration, but you know, if you prefer something like, you know, you do you, whatever works for you, that's great. Uh, but yeah, this, this avocado data set, I'm just saying avocado a lot. I guess it just rolls off the tongue, you know, <laughs> um, but we have a date column. Um, as you can see, the original uh, data from Kaggle. It was actually just by, by truly the date. And so I changed it to timestamp because that is, um, something that we need when we use time vector. So, you know, it, it's the dates, but the, you know, all the zeros look great. I'm sure. <laughs> but then we have average price of the avocados, um, total volume sold, um, we have these different columns, which I believe have to do with specific types of avocados, I think. And then we have total bags, small bags, large bags, X large bags, and um, type year and region. Ooh, it looks like year came in at a, with a funny... Uh, data type. That's interesting. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is the data that we're going to play with today. Just, you know, it's easy. It's one table, nothing too crazy. Um, but kind of my, one of my first questions is, so say that, you know, I have this data and I want to graph the change in the average price for the Harrisburg Scranton region during the year of 2017 and how would I do that with pipelines? So that was a lot. I, I decided to pick Harrisburg Scranton because I'm from Pennsylvania. Um, and, you know, for those of you who are office fans, you can't not pick Scranton, you know, that's just too fun. So what I have here is um, this code. And so, right, I, I wanted to know the change in the average price for Harrisburg Scranton during the year of 2017. And so how I can do this with this awesome fu function pipeline, um, 
is that you know I have my time vector, so that's the the new uh, data type or yeah, the new kind of like wrapped up data type that we have, and I'm including my date as an input because it has two inputs, right? We need a timestamp input, which is my date. And then we need some kind of numeric input, which I'm choosing average price because, right, I want to know the change in the average price. Um, so then I'm going to sort. And because the, the, the screen is pretty large, I could, I guess I could put this in the more typical I was worried that it wouldn't fit, but it looks like it actually fits pretty okay. So, <laughs> so I'm going to sort by the time, right? And then I'm going to take the delta, which right is going to be the change in the price, right? And then I'm specifying, I want to know only over the year of 2017. So I specify where the date is as such. And then I'm going to specify that the region is the Harrisburg Scranton region. So we're going to run this. I was wondering if this was the case. Does not exist. Huh. Without time zone. Well, this is interesting. This worked earlier. Um, does not exist. Okay. I don't know, David, do you have a, a, a query to show? I can figure out why this is angry hey, at me. Uh, sorry, so uh, you just have to cast it to a uh, timestamp TV. Okay, because I, I thought I had this earlier. Let's see, no, it's angry at me. Why uh, is this? Um, well, sorry, do you have, no, that, that's not the problem. Uh, did you set your, your uh, search path? I did. I will set it set again. It this, you said it in this session. It has to be in the session that you're in. Ah, okay. That's probably the problem. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. So again, because this is in uh, uh, the experimental schema, all of these things, I mean, if you put toolkit experimental dot time vector in here, it would just work. Um, uh, so that is uh, one thing to do. Um, so actually, if you want to share my screen for a second, I can show you uh, a little clearer here. Um, I'm using Postico to do this. It's a Mac. Uh, it's a great Mac little app for. Um, so I just set my search path to public and then the toolkit experimental and I even included the time scale BB experimental because I decided to use the next generation time bucket, which allows me to bucket by a month. Um, and so then I was just showing a, a few of the uh can i make the text bigger maybe <sighs> how do i do that font bigger is that better <laughs> better should i keep going we'll we keep heard that going. from jonatas is How's this that? good how are we feeling better? about this okay i'm gonna assume that that's okay um, it is significantly larger than it was. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I set my search path to public comma the, the two experimental schemas that allows me to use time bucket ng this. So the other way, of course, that I can call any of these is to say, to, to schema qualify them. So schema qualifying basically means I put the schema name and then a dot, and that's going to give me that, um, schemas, uh, if folks remember, are uh, are also called namespaces, um, and so this is sort of the namespacing that that we're doing here. However, it's kind of ugly when we do it this way, so I'm going to not do that uh, because I set my search path. So that's another way you could do this, though, if you wanted to. Um, so this gives us another way of calling these functions. Right, this is the same as um, right. So if I did this, this, this would be equal to, um, and then I get another parent. And this is just a, it's partially to help us like, right. So you'll see that that is true. Right. Um, now, uh, you know, this doesn't make a huge difference when we're dealing with 
this type of uh, aggregate where it's just one step. Um, however, we've been introducing new aggregates like the counter aggregates. Now, there isn't anything that's actually a counter here, but we can pretend. Um, <laughs> We can pretend that something is so we can pretend that you know large bags is actually a counter which is not a counter is supposed to be monotonically increasing mm -hmm. um obviously large bags is not uh, whatever if that's okay um uh however Just imagine one of the things that you need to do is um like pass in uh the uh range that each of these is doing. And we do that with a with bounds. Uh, and of course it's not gonna work because I'm using time bucket ng, which means it's a time bucket for now. And we'll take it, we'll make it 10 days. So when we when we do with bounds, we pass in a time bucket range, uh, which we currently create, but we're, I think I've got the database team on moving into the database. Uh, and I need to pass in this, which is a little bit painful. But so this is part of why we want to do this is is that if I if I nested this, like now we have like this with bounds with a time bucket range inside of it, it's like a little bit unclear what's what here. Um, and then I can do my say delta or increase or whatever else, or let's say it's my extrapolated rate. With a Prometheus, with the Prometheus approach, and so this is taking a counter, which is something that that comes from languages like PromQL, and so we have an extrapolated rate, which is equivalent to, um, I think, the rate, just the, the the rate function on a counter. There may also be a different name for it in in Prometheus, but so we're extrapolating to the edges of these bounds, and that's how we express this. But we want to make sure that you can actually do that in like a sane way, and so you don't have like six levels of nested parentheses. Um, so that's part of what this function pipelining in, uh, an aggregate allows you to do is really just make that a little bit easier. Uh, I don't know. I probably have missed a parenthesis somewhere. Um, yeah. I think it's there. Oh yeah. Sorry. <laughs> the true the true struggle of coding <laughs> and or live live action there coding you know, you so have that's going to give us uh, a little bit more i mean and this is a little bit silly because the it doesn't make any sense here um uh, like i said this isn't actually a counter so this data doesn't make any sense but that's okay you can get a sense of what this does um and so you can imagine just how much this would be annoying if like I already messed up the parentheses even with the nicer syntax that we have here. Um, if I had to then wrap this right like this would normally be with bounds blah, 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 and it just gets a little crazy with the parentheses. So that's how we use it with um, aggregates. Um, Miranda, can I pass back to you? Do you want to take do you want to do one of the function pipelines? We can talk about that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I <laughs> did. <laughs> No, yeah, big a good note to do to make is that um, if you do want to use the functionality, um, the pipeline functionality, yeah, setting your search path is a you want you want to do that. <laughs> um, it will definitely well it will allow you to have a much neater code and actually use like you know the functions as you know we're intending them to be used, especially whenever we move them from experimental to like fully fledged supported functions. So yeah, pretty much just to pick up where I left off, um, I am taking my average price, you know, over time, I'm going to sort it um, on the time column. And then I'm going to take the difference, the delta between each time period. Um, and then I'm just specifying that I want it, you know, only over the 2017 year. Um, and the region is the Harrisburg Scranton region. So if I run this and essentially this unnest, essentially, like if I were to take away the unnest, you can see, um, we get the time vector object. 
I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's the correct way to describe it, David. You can that's definitely correct. Yeah. correct. Okay. <laughs> um, and unnesting it is just allowing me. Ooh, oops. I'm so used to using a Mac. I always press the wrong button whenever I want to undo. This is I'm, I'm using a Windows right now. <laughs> um, yeah. So if I were to put unnest back, right, it's just kind of taking that object and unnesting it, you know, it's yeah. So let's, let's also talk a little bit about that. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so when you unnest it like this, what you're actually getting back, as you can see there are time value pairs. Um, so if you want the, the time value columns, what you can do is outside of those parentheses, you can put a dot star. Uh, yep. And then if you run that, Dot star. Uh, sorry, you need to wrap it in one more set of parentheses. Ah, okay. <laughs> All of it unnested. No, no, no. Uh, oh. Before the dot star. Okay. Here. And, and around unnest. Okay. So that's going to get you the time value pairs. Um, this is basically just taking advantage of the. Um, the way that uh, composite types work in Postgres. Um, so with any composite type, you can you can wrap it in parens and then put a dot star or access individual fields by doing dot time or dot value in this case. Um, the other thing here is that unnest is also a Python element. So I could take that unnest that I wrapped in there and I could just put it at the end of my pipeline instead. Um, oh. And that would work too. So oh, I guess I could keep the parentheses here. Yep, you keep the parentheses mm -hmm. exactly. Yep. And so that'll give us the same thing if you run that. That's I super think that should sweet. Work. Um, yeah. So, and that I think also makes it look a little nicer. Um, it does. <laughs> yeah. Um, eventually, we're also going to have things like um, uh, JSON output. Uh, so, you know, that's one of the things that we'd love folks to uh, to go and um, mention on our GitHub, like what sorts of output do you want? Like what sorts of formats do you want this in? For instance, I can imagine that I might want eventually like something like this so that I can graph it, right? So mm -hmm. if I, especially mm -hmm. if I'm using LTPB or something like that, that's a really good algorithm for, for, um, for graphing. Um, I'll get to that in a second, uh, Jonah Tess. Um, uh, so it's a really good algorithm for graphing and like you might want your X, Y values or your time values in a, a lot of graphing tools take like an array of times and then an array of values and they're sort of matched up point by point. Um, so one thing that we could, we could do is provide an output that is in that format for various graphing tools. And you basically have like, uh, something that's like, uh, uh, I don't know, output or materialize, I think is the function that we're calling it now. Um, and you'd put in a special format. Um, and that format would be then what you get as a materialization. Um, so those are some of the pipeline elements that we're sort of thinking about doing. And we would love some input from users on in terms of what you want, what you need um, for that type of output. Um, the unnest here, uh, Jonatas. So Jonatas asked, um, the unnested, whether the unnest is in the toolkit or Question. it's using the unnest from PG. Um, so it is uh, similar to what unnest in Postgres does, but it's actually a different thing. So unnest, unnest in Postgres unnest arrays. Um, it doesn't unnest our thing, but we made an unnest that works similarly, similarly to that for time vectors. Um, so it is in fact a toolkit thing because it's working on our special type, not on an array. Um, so one thing that I did want to mention also, like you can also use time vectors. Um, maybe I can go, you can share my screen again and I'll quickly do this. Uh, so uh, and I guess we can use like bag. Yeah, I agree, Jonatas. This is very, very cool. I'm like, just learning every second here. <laughs> um, so <Awesome. laughs> you might not, 
right now, time vectors work entirely in memory. If you want to do some operations on them, you can still time bucket them. So uh, I can still use them with time bucket. Uh, And we'll group by one. Uh, that's probably too small because there's only one value per day. So maybe we'll do, well, let's use time bucket ng again. And we'll do well, one month. Or maybe let's make it three months. Okay, so now this is going to produce time vectors, right, for each three month period that I have. Um, that's super neat. Right. And then I can do each, uh, like, then I can get each operation, right? So sort delta, um, like, we can look at the, we can do our volatility calculation. Um, so we can look at the total volatility of the number, like, the number of large bags sold in each three month period, um, right? And that'll, That'll work like that. Um, uh, can't put that here, unfortunately. Uh, so, um, and and so that's the sort of thing that, that you can now do here. I would definitely recommend that you that you at least sometimes are going to want to use a time bucket with these time vectors. Um, you're going to want to group by other stuff, obviously. Like if we had uh, like different. I know sales regions are, you know, we do have sales, sales regions. So we could actually group this by region too. Yeah, it's nice that you can like have time bucket and region kind of outside of the time vector to allow for like additional grouping. That's really yeah. cool. So that's the, that's the basic gist is now we have it grouped by region. We can do that volatility calculation. I could select a given region. Um, I, I think it's a pretty nifty, yeah. So let's order by two comma one. Um, Super nifty, in fact. So, so then that's going to get us our, our volatility. Um, I mean, and you could even start doing like, I mean, I could even then, uh, right, so this then can go, I can make another time vector. I can also do things like, uh, just produce the time vector, or let's say I wanted to do um, different calculations on a part of my time vector. Uh, so I could just do this um, in, like, say, a with clause, so a CTE. And then I can take my time vector and uh, let's name this so that we don't just call it TV for now, just for the heck of it. <laughs> and so now I can do TV and the T. Yeah. <laughs> Table. Uh, TV. It's not a T. <laughs> um, and I don't know, let's do T. Uh, I don't know, we could do average. Yeah, mm. average one two. I don't. I don't think this is actually going to make that much sense, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, you you have to record the something. It's very important. Um, <laughs> that was awesome. So that's going to be. Uh, what do we call this? We'll call this bucket. Uh, so we'll do bucket. Right. So so that's the. Um, the basic gist of then how I can use it a little bit more in a more advanced way. Um, I can now, and, and there's other really cool things that I can get into. Um, I don't know how much time we have left. Um, so but, that 10 oh, minutes, so. <laughs> okay. So let's, let's, let's do the real advanced stuff that I'm hopefully <laughs> going to write a post about at some point. Um, so some of the cool things that you can then do with, uh, our, uh, Time, like the, these pipelines. So because these time vector pipelines actually return a special type on their own, I can actually define a function pipeline 
I, I can define my own operations on it. Um, actually, we never got into lambdas. I could also go over that, but. Oh yeah, that's right. Oh, Honestly, well, okay. I, yeah. <laughs> There's just so much awesome content. You just can't get over it. Right? So, uh, okay, so lambda. <laughs> so the lambda syntax is really quite a, quite a bit of fun. We have something, so we can define a lambda and there, there are a couple of variables that are, that are special, special in that. So, um, let's say I wanted to take, let's just go back to our original query. Um, so instead of, you know, after I do the Delta, I want to do, I don't know, I want to do the square, the value squared. Like I want to apply a function to that value that I've now produced. Um, so that would be something like this. So you can't use just like add, like I can't just use mul, uh, which is our like multiplier or multiply by five. That's not good enough. What I want to do, or I can't, I can't even use the pow, right? Which does like that'll square my value. But if I want like x squared plus x plus three, right? Like some sort of quadratic equation, I can't use pow to, uh, and then uh, like, and then add add five because that like I'm missing my x term and it's now not going to be the x it's going to actually be like these things are applied in order so like if I if I square it I have the value squared I don't have the original value it, like anymore I can't use it anymore so um, and if I multiply by five or whatever so if I'm like trying to do x plus five x plus x squared plus five x plus three as my formula like I just can't express that with just the basic mathematical functions that we have. Um, so instead, let's do, we're going to use map, which applies a lambda to a vector. Um, and we're going to use uh, dollar quoted strings for this. Um, and we're just going to apply something to the value. So we'll do value plus Right, and but so that's tell, now. Tell, tell me about like the this what you're writing in the map, the like dollar signs. What so? Mm -hmm. So the first thing that, that we're doing here is a dollar quoted string. Um, I could actually just make this a normal string because I don't have anything Got it, in okay. here that's going to be problematic. So this would work just fine. Um, let me show you that's right. So that's what that'll work there. Um, the thing about this is, so the dollar value is just a way of referring to the value column inside of my time vector. Um, cool. Now, so it's very similar to like how I would, you know, do this in like Python or something else. Like, you know, I'm identifying yeah. the ob the you know objects or variable from another piece. That's really cool. So I so so here all I'm doing is I'm passing in a string. Right. Um, right. So this is just a string. Uh, why did that happen? No. Uh, so <laughs> if, if I just return this, right, like that's fine. Um, but if I want to do something like if so, the other thing that you can do, by the way, is you can actually modify the times as well. And I can return a time value pair. So I could do time So when we, when we want to use intervals uh, in here, we, we just use a string and we put an I after it, and that's going to be our interval. Um, and if we're returning a time value pair, I, do, I just do something like this. Um, the thing about this is now you see why I'm using dollar quoted strings. So right. when I have another string inside of a string, I either have to escape it by putting an extra thing by each of them, which like, okay, right. that's fine, but it gets really annoying really fast. But I can also use these things that Postgres provides, which are called dollar quoted strings, which means I just put two dollar signs, um, and that's going to it's going to treat this whole thing as a string. Um, so uh, there are no other variables, Jonatas. So Jonatas asked what what variables are available other than time and value. Um, so not yet. Uh, we can't yet do anything with like looking looking back or whatever. We may provide that at some point in the future. It may be something like reduce or there may be some other way of, of doing that. Yeah. So make a make a feature request on that also. Um, if you want to be able to do that, we may be we may be able to add some syntax like that. Um, the other thing, so on dollar quoted strings, by the way, you can also like 
dollar quoted strings are cool in their own right. So they're tagged. So if I write, um, I can then close it with another. And then I could nest them too if I wanted to. But anyway, dollar quoted strings are fun. It produces the same thing uh, is the basic gist though. So um, that's what lambdas do. That's, they're, they're really quite fun. I urge you to explore them. Um, they're very powerful and have a lot of stuff, like a lot of really fun stuff that we're gonna be doing there. You can also provide filters with lambdas, um, which are Boolean lambdas. Um, so then the next, but the next thing that I think is really interesting here is that, um, so let's look at this pipeline itself. I can actually run this pipeline without a time vector at the beginning. Hmm. What do you get? Oh, it's, it's very small. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at the type of that. So we get something that, that uh, I don't know how to make this bigger. I think this is the thing that <laughs> we learned as we go. <laughs> uh, at some point, uh, I will figure out how to do that. Next time. Uh, Next time we yeah. will. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> the point is, is that this. Yeah. So PG type of, by the way, determines the type of a thing in Postgres. Um, so if you ever want to know the type of thing, you can do PG, PG type of. And what we get is this um, with some capitalization to, to make it a little more readable. Um, this is what we actually call it. We call it an unstable time vector pipeline. We're calling it unstable because it's really, we're not sure. Like, so this, by the way, is like all the stuff that I'm doing now we're getting beyond the, the hour mark, right? So this is all really freaking <laughs> experimental. Um, don't hey, expect, this is like, don't be using this in production. Extra just yet. Stuff. This is where this is where this is where this is going. Um, so okay. So here's the thing that's really interesting about this that I think is really cool anyway. Um, and this is sort of a sneak preview of some of the stuff that we may end up doing in some more blog posts and things like that. Um, I, I can actually treat pipelines. So first off, this that I can make a pipeline at my own function very easily. I can say create a replace function. Um, we'll call it. Oh. Um, OK. It's actually just going to not take in anything. And it's going to return. And it returns uh, unstable time vector pipeline. Um, right. Um, uh, and it's going to be uh, uh, immutable. Uh, immutable parallel phase. Do I need a comma? I think I need a comma here. Maybe not. I don't know. Someone tell. Uh, Okay, so now I can define that function. We also often use these uh, dollar coded strings and that, and, and that create a replace function um, as just this, right? And so that's my special element. That's it, I think. Yeah, so no problem. It's only select though. Okay. Um, okay, so that, okay. So first off, again, this stuff is still unstable, but the API may change. So if you actually wanna do like create something that depends on it, you require you to set, set a special uh, uh, um, uh, guck. So I will just run that. So that I can do this. So once I do that, now I can create that function. Now I can create a time vector and just do right, and that returns the same thing as the other one. That's really so that cool. runs that whole pipeline. Now, 
if we want to get more advanced with this, um, you know, getting in deeper. I could say, well, maybe each region actually has a, a special calculation that I want to run on each region. Each region is different. I don't know. It has whatever, like it has its own weird fit. I don't, it doesn't really matter. Um, it may not be exactly um, the, the same thing as um, uh, like the right thing here, but like in our, in our thermometer example, like if you think about thermocouples, thermocouples actually have to be calibrated at times. They might have their own calibration curves um, and each thermocouple might be different. They might have different errors depending on how old they are, like the different types of thermocouples. So I really need to apply a special function for each one. And I don't want to have to create a special function for each thermocouple. I'd much rather have that in a table. So I can create a table. Um, in this case, we'll do regions. Um, and it'll be text and calculation. Okay, so we'll create that table. And we can insert then, and it looks like one was Albany. Uh, I don't know. That's, uh, yeah, we have lots of different regions you can choose from. <laughs> Boston, California, Chicago, Atlanta. Cool, so Chicago, we'll say Chicago, um, oh, Pittsburgh. <laughs> and then we can return, we can actually take this pipeline, right? And, uh, and we'll actually just run this as a sub query, and I think this should work. Uh, um, and let's choose another one. Just make sure they spelled it the way that they spelled it. And then uh, we'll just do a completely different pipeline. Let's hope this works. So this one now, I mean, maybe we don't want that. We want sort map and then we can have a completely different we want the cube and you know eight times ten i don't know um oh did you get the parentheses before the select nope cool uh let's see if this works okay so that worked and now i can actually apply my calculation by doing a join where like my regions are in Chicago and Houston, like I want to apply each region's um, calculation for each region. And so now I can take my original thing and a lot of where clause and some other stuff. And so let's say, And we're just going to say time vector. And actually, let's do let's do something slightly different because I would I would prefer to do this join um, on this. So so we're going to do this. So we're gonna group by one, group by one and two, and we're gonna actually then take time vex and we're gonna join it to. Um, 
Also, now, I think okay. Chicago and Houston also needs a, a parenthesis. Yes, it does. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, okay, so so we're gonna now select from time vectors. We've, we've made our time vectors, um, and let's let's just make. I'm gonna still call that PD because it's a little smaller to to write. So um, we can also then uh, get our values. So I can join this now to. I can join time vex to uh, my regions table. So we'll do that here from. Okay, and we're, we're going to select and the uh, bucket time back down region. Uh, and then we'll do TV. And we're just going to apply now regions. You can actually apply the calculation like that. So calculation is now a column. And I'm going to apply the correct one by doing this join. And so each one will then get the correct calculation applied to it based on which region it's in and which and the, and the calculation that we the special calculation that we define for that region. Um, why? Timbex. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, so now that's really cool. Right. So that allows me to now like the like these functions now become values in a, in a weird and interesting way. Um, this is like how what one of the cool things about functional programming generally and one of the things that this sort of stuff allows um, is that code and data now become a little bit closer together and actually store our code in the database. Um, and like I could update the calculation for each region. Um, so that's the sort of stuff that this then allows who knows if this is useful like this is again another thing where like we want you to tell us like we want you to find the cool ways of using this and tell us if this is actually useful or if this is like just weird and like a, a, a fun fact but not actually useful to anyone in the real world um and if it's not then like you know we won't prioritize it. if it is then like we can prioritize things around that um so i think that that's the like very fast uh but <laughs> a rather deep version of going into time vectors in, in fun ways um and uh i think we're about about done with my stuff for today um, <laughs> so we can go deeper in, in other streams or whatever else at some point um so that's all yeah no that was awesome i totally agree with you jonatas that was like to think that you can join on a table and apply functions based on that join like that to i, I don't i i feel like I, that could totally be useful but of course like as david said definitely give us feedback because i i'm also just curious to know how people are like going to use these functions because i feel like there is this creative space i don't know if david you would agree with that but like it seems like there's just like a lot of ways that you could play around with these new pipeline functions. And I don't know, I'm, I'm really pumped to see like what people do with them. <laughs> yeah, I guess, but before we do leave, um, so we have this awesome new pipeline functionality, which is really exciting. But in addition, we also released this week or really um, upgraded this week the stats ag, counter ag, and hyper log log hyper functions from experimental to full fledged hyper functions. So all the stuff that David said about, you know, being careful with experimental functions, definitely give us feedback on experimental functions and how we can, you know, improve on them. But we are excited to now be upgrading some of these experimental functions to now ones that you can use with more confidence. So that includes, again, stats ag, counter ag, and hyper log log, which is very exciting that we will also have access to them. So. I think that's everything. Thank you so much, David. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah.
Cool beans. Well, thank you all again for joining us. Um, this was super thanks, awesome. Totally. Yeah. And thanks for, and, uh, for, for helping lead this. This was really great. Oh, no, I, I just, I love this. I feel like I learned so much. This is awesome. <laughs> all right, everyone. Have an awesome rest of your day and happy coding. See you all next time.